In this video, we're going to review section 4.3, which for us is finding the area under the curve using uh, the sum or the Riemann sums, and we also did trapezoidal rule. Now, if I take my calculator, I have a little program here, and I can show you the pictures that are associated with the Riemann sums. So if I take a function, and I'll, I'll pause and put all these in. So I have a function, y equals 6 minus x squared. I want a left bound to be 0, upper bound to be 3, and partitions, that's our n value of 6. So the width of each one of these rectangles, well, this distance is 3, and I'm splitting the 6 equal parts, is going to be 1 half. So delta x is 1 half. And then if I enter this, it will give me a graph. Now, what I will do, too, is that I'll, I'll do all these sums for you. Left sum. There's the left sum. And so I'm taking the height at the leftmost point of this interval uh, from the curve, and then so on and so on. Since this is a decreasing function, this would be an overestimate using the left sums. There's my number. That's the area of all those rectangles. Now what I can do, too, is I can do the right sums. And notice that this one even goes underneath a little bit. So our area becomes 6.625. This area becomes a negative quantity. And so we subtract it off of all these other ones that we added together. This one we subtract out too. And then I can do the uh, midpoint. Notice the heights of these rectangles. So for instance, this one right here. If I take this midpoint x value right here, and find the height of the curve, that would be the height of my rectangle. This is not the trapezoidal rule. Midpoint is totally different than the trapezoidal rule. Trapezoid would average this value and average this value, which is not necessarily this value here. And so we get a midpoint sum. And then the trapezoid, and I'm just showing you the pictures really, trapezoid would uh, find the area this way, and we get another different value. Now, what happens as these rectangles, this delta x, goes to 0, or as we say, the number of rectangles goes to infinity? Well, then I would get a nice, perfect fit under the curve. There's still gaps here under this trapezoidal rule, but we would get a, a nice, tight fit if these widths would go to 0. And I can do that with something that's called the definite integral. So this is finding the area under the curve, which they turns out to be area of 9. Okay? And so there's our definite integral. So this one, uh, this area would get subtracted off from this area because this one is below the x-axis. So this, we apply a negative quantity to the area. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, how we would write this uh, equation for this curve this would be what we call the definite integral for that. My lower bound, we call this the lower bound of integration, is 0. The upper bound of integration is 3. And here's my function. I cover it up with parentheses, and I multiply it by dx. Well, what happens to all this dx and all this other stuff that we're dealing with? Well, if you remember, we have the sum, i equal to 1 to n, of my rectangles. And they're going to be evaluated at different points here. So what I have is, uh, let me just call it f of ci. So I'm going to have a height for this rectangle at many different places times my width of my rectangles. And so as I make more and more rectangles, this would be the limit as n goes to infinity. You also could say the limit as delta x goes to 0. As delta x goes to 0, we don't call it delta x anymore. We call it dx. So this is the area of a rectangle. When I do my definite integral, I also do the heights from here and my widths from here. And so I'm still summing up. I call this the great summing machine. I'm still summing up area under the curve. But then this would be what we call the definite integral. How do we work this one out? Well, we take the antiderivative. This would be 6x minus x cubed over 3. And then we evaluate it from 0 to 3. Plug the 3 in first. And I'm just going to pause this. In. So in this portion, I plug in the 3. In this portion, I plug in the 0. I subtract the two quantities, and I get 9, which is exactly the same thing that our calculator told us. All right. 
So hopefully some of this stuff is coming together for you. This summation symbol turns into this smooth S because we're going as n goes to infinity, etc. Okay, so this just means the area under the curve from 0 to 3. Now if we go to our notes now, uh, back to here, what we have then is this situation, and this is what I just wrote out. This is probably a little bit better way that it is written. And so we're finding the area under the curve, and that's with the definite integral. Now, you can't always find the antiderivative, so sometimes what happens is that you have to draw a picture and do it ge geometrically. If you know what this is, well, this is a circle with a radius of 7. And I shouldn't say circle, it's a semicircle because all the values are positive. So this is 7 and negative 7. So what I can do is say, oh, area under the curve, it's a semicircle. I can do that geometrically. So area is equal to 1 half pi r squared. And so then that would be 49 over 2 pi. There's your area. And so I'm dividing by 2 because it's only the semicircle and not the full circle. Now here's some rules for integration, and maybe some of these would be intuitive to you, so maybe you can try some of these. But if I take the area under the curve from A to A, what's the area of a line? Oh, zero. And then what if I reverse the limits? Instead of going from A to B, I go to from B to A of f of x. Well, what happens is if you go backwards, we actually get the opposite quantity, as if I went from A to B. All right, and under area principles from your geometry days, I can take area of one piece and add it to the area of another piece. So, for instance, here, if I go from A to C and then C to B, what would be the overall area? Well, I think that I can go from A to B because I just cross over there. Now, the question becomes, well, what if C is not... What if C is not in between A and B? What if C is out someplace? Well, let's take a look at this and see what happens. So if I have a curve here, here's A, here's B, and here's C. Well, if I take the area from A to C, that would be all that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the area from C to B. Well, that's taking this quantity in here, this little rectangle, but I'm going in reverse. So what do I do with that? Well, I'm going to subtract that off. Well, if you can notice, that black area minus this green area turns out to be the integral from A to B. So this, I hope that instructions or my explanation worked, but this works even though C is not even in between A and B, this works for all C as long as the function is continuous defined and all those kinds of things. Uh, from our derivative days, this number four, the constant just goes along for the ride. Same thing here, so I can take it out in front. I cannot do that with variables. You can never pull variables out. You can only pull constants out. Be careful with that. And then also I can take the integral of a sum, and that's the same thing as the sum of the integrals. So a to b of f of x, I need a dx on that one because I need the width of the rectangles, or I'm adding up the area, I should say. And then this one would be a to b of g of x dx. So the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. All right, let's apply our rules a little bit down here. So I give you some information, this one and this one. What if I ask, what's the integral from 0 to 6 of f of x? Well, it's the area of this piece plus the area of this piece. You can try these two and pause and then come back and check your answers. What if I reverse the limits? What happens here? Negative 2. And then if I take negative 4 times some function, and it's 0 to 4, all I'm doing is I'm pulling out in front, so I'm just taking negative 4 times this. 8, so I get negative 32. And this one, if I go from negative 6 to negative 4, what I have is uh, for this one, I don't have enough information to follow any of these rules. 
just because I changed the sign here, it doesn't change anything else. The curve of f of x might be totally different in this interval as compared to this interval. So we don't know that one. All right, moving on. Uh, here's some examples. I got this one written out, but I'll go through this. All this leads us to section 4.4, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Number one, there's two fundamental theorems of calculus. Now, uh, we did a worksheet where we found that a position function taking the upper limit of the position function and then subtract out what happens when I plug in the lower limit of that position function, that will give me displacement. Well, that's the same thing as finding the area under the curve from A to B of my velocity curve. That leads us to the fundamental theorem of calculus where these two things are equal to each other. But instead of using velocity, I use velocity as the introduction because it's intuitive to a lot of you. We can translate this now over to any function where we have the integral from A to B of f of x dx, once again, this is area, is equal to capital F, we means that it, this is the antiderivative of little f. It doesn't always mean that, but in this case it does, f of b minus f of a. I do not need the plus c with the definite integral because if I had plus c and then I had plus c over here, what happens to your c's? They would cancel out. So we don't deal with the constant of inter integration for the definite integral. All right, so if we do this, Essentially, we just take the antiderivative, and then we evaluate from 2 to 3. What I like to do is I plug in the 3 here, 27 over 3 plus 9 minus 3. Then when I subtract, I'm going to subtract what happens when I plug in the lower limit. I like to put a square bracket. What this does for me is it reminds me, Oh, you better subtract everything. So I need to distribute this value. So if I plug in 2, I get 8 thirds plus 4 minus 2. And I can find this. This is 31 thirds. So the area under the curve is 31 thirds from 2 to 3 of this function. Moving on, if I see the square root, I might want to rewrite that. 4x to the 1 half dx, integral 1 to 2. And if I take the antiderivative, this would be 4, raise it to the 1 higher power, divide by 3 halves, which means multiply by 2 thirds. The 4 is already there. I put these together. Evaluate from 1 to 2. So this would be 8, 2 to the 3 halves, over 3, minus 8, 1 to the 3 halves, over 3. This equals, one of these twos can come out, one of them can't, so 16 squared at 2, all over 3 minus, that'd be just 8 thirds. There's your answer. That would be exact. You can also get a decimal answer depending upon what they want. In this class, it's always three decimal places. What's the antiderivative of the secant squared for this next example? Well, that's the tangent because we know that the derivative of the tangent is secant squared. I do this from 0 to pi over 3. The tangent pi over 3 minus the tangent of 0. Now, sometimes when we plug in 0, we get 0. Sometimes we don't. So be careful. Don't just think that that turns to 0 all the time. But here the tangent of pi over 3 would be just square root of 3. And then this would be minus 0, so just square root of 3 because the tangent is 0. This one we want to rewrite. So if I rewrite this one, uh, I use the rabbit method. This and this, x to the 1 half, I subtract. So this would be x to the negative 3 halves minus 4 x to the negative 2. I haven't done any integration yet. So make sure you put the integral symbol in there, dx. And then so. Um, I take the antiderivative of each one of these pieces. x to the 1 higher power divided by negative 1 half, which means multiply by negative 2, 
minus this piece here raised to the one higher power would be negative one so four x to the negative one divide by negative one so that becomes plus and I'm evaluating from two to three so this is equal to negative two I plug in the three so that would be square root of three and the denominator since it's negative plus four over three minus if I plug in two so this would be negative 2 over the square root of 2. And then I plug in 2 here. This would be 4 over 2. So this would be plus 2. Make sure you distribute this negative. I'll let you figure out what that answer is. Check it with your calculator. Now find the area bounded by x equal to 1, x equal to 2, and this function here. So if I graph this, y equals x squared plus 1. It's the x squared function, then it's shifted up 1. My bounds here would be 1 and 2. Sorry, I'm being slanted here. But this would be the area that we are talking about. So if I set this up into an integral, this would be lower limit 1, upper limit 2, x squared plus 1, and dx. That is the definite integral that represents the area under this curve. So now I can take the antiderivative, x cubed over 3 plus x evaluate from 1 to 2 so it's going to be 8 thirds plus 2 minus 1 third plus 1 once again I'll let you simplify that but that's the answer okay now what about something like this well what happens with the absolute value is that we get a sharp point with sharp points a lot of times what we have to do is split the integral into two pieces and this goes back to one of our previous rules about splitting up the area. So if I take this function, 6 minus x squared, 6 minus x squared is a function like this where this is the square root of x, uh, square root of 6. Now what's going to happen since I have the absolute value, I'm going to have to um, take this and I'm going to have to rebound it. And so it's going to be like this. So what happens at this point is that essentially it breaks up two areas. So I want to find this area first, and then I need to find this area second. And so what I do is, and this actually should be more curved like this. What I do then is I take the integral from 0. Remember that this is square root of, zi uh, square root of 6. I just set this function equal to 0. So this is from 0 to square root of 6 of 6 minus x squared dx. That would be this first piece. The second piece here, I'm going to make it green. I'm going to take the integral now from square root of 6 up to my 10. And now what function am I dealing with? Well, this got flipped over a little bit. You really take the opposite of this function. So it's going to be x squared minus 6. I change the sign of both. And that's going to be dx. So this would be the area of the blue piece. And this, my, my picture is horrible. But then this would be the area of my green piece. And I have to put those two together. So you can look at these geometrically, split them up into pieces, and then that would sort things out for you as well. But you do have to do this if you have this bounce back point. Let's put it into pieces. All right, I hope you're getting a good idea of what the antiderivative and the definite integral are. And it's based on our Riemann sums, finding the area under the curve. And if we make these rectangles go to, the width go to zero, then we get the exact area under the curve, which just turns into finding the antiderivative and plugging in the upper and lower limits and taking the difference. Thank you very much. Uh, here's your homework. I hope you have a great day.